going? Hey, Jasper. Long Great to see you again. See. Yeah, good to see you too, man. You're wearing the same, the, the, <laughs> the same sweater. Yes. Oh, yeah. The, I got to bring it out for you. <laughs> and Call it. Well, I'll reveal my entire outfit. I'm also wearing mushroom pants. Oh, nice. And I have mushroom shoes as well. Oh, no, you got mushroom shoes, man. I'm jealous. You didn't know these existed. Not yet. No, are, man. Those are those are fire. I'm going to need a mascara shoes. With this nice one. Yeah. Isn't that cool? I haven't nice. worn them yet, but. No, I see. They're, they're fancy looking. Solid, so how man. are you? Uh, I'm I'm good. And like also just like at the end of like a little being a little sick. We just finished last week on Sunday. We finished the eighth course in like since September. <laughs> A course less retreat and then my body just shut down but we also launched the fungal ecology course so couldn't really rest but then yesterday like the the, the fungal ecology went live so i was able to rest and i feel a lot better now wow congratulations lots of, lots of peaks and highlights and just physically some struggles but that's feeling well, better now as well. does it feel How good to to finally have it done mm -hmm. oh yeah no, for sure. And it's still like the fungal ecology course is still going. We're doing modules every week and like with guest speakers like William Padilla Brown and Juliana Fursi and some other epic mycologists. So it's all, yeah, super fun. That's amazing. So uh, yeah, man. I guess for the audience, I should introduce you really quick. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so Go you're, ahead. so today we have a super fun guest. We have Jasper DeGenars. He's from the Netherlands. He's a mycologist and a teacher at the Fungi Academy in Guatemala. We've done a couple after school videos with Jasper that have been a blast to do, one on panspermia and the other on fungal intelligence. Jasper is an awesome resource for anything related to mushrooms and fungi, and we're really lucky to have him on the show today. So, welcome. Thanks, man. That was a did I, good did I get it right? on the sure name. <laughs> Always fun to, to hear uh, <laughs> English natives try to pronounce oh my, my surname. Everybody, <laughs> how, how do you pronounce your, your last name? Degenaars. It's a very Dutch. Oh my god! Yeah, I know. <laughs> that was going to be my second guess. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a little funny bit that there's so few people in the world with this surname that like it's very likely that Alan DeGeneres is a, a like really long distance lost cousin of like a branch of the family that moved to the United States. And because people wouldn't be able to pronounce the last name, wow. they just changed it. That's what like they used to do a lot. That's amazing. Little so fun fact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I've been watching this show lately and I wanted to ask you about it. Mm. It's called The Last of Us. It's a really popular show on HBO. And the entire premise of this show is that fungi infect people's minds and turn them into zombies and i know we've discussed this a little bit but i'd love for you to is there any realistic truth to this could this happen uh yeah i've seen the show a lot it looks great i i played the video game like a decade ago and i, I must say it was one of the best stories in video game and i heard they stayed true to the story so if they stay true to the source material it, like it's it's super good um if it's like can happen uh no so they based this off of like the the zombie and fungus which we discussed in fungal intelligence uh ophiocordyceps unilateralis and so you have this whole branch of fungi that specialize in killing insects and taking over insect bodies is one of the ways that they do it these are called entomopathogenic fungi and they're very successful and they're very important in keeping the balance in the ecosystem because nothing else can sometimes like contain like a colony of ants because they're so successful and so good at what they're doing. Um, uh, surprise, surprise, humans aren't ants. We have really complex immune systems that ants don't have. And um, there's a side note to it is that we're also warm blooded, right? So that's a really like fungi like warmth, but they don't like heat. Like we're our body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is in freedom units, but like uh, if it's 37 degrees out, it's hot out, you know, and there's some fungi in 
in jungles and stuff that will survive. Um, but generally, it's a little bit cooler, or they are hiding underground, or they're inside a tree or some leaves. Um, but like in our bodies, they don't like it. And there's a really cool example of a fungus that actually infects a mammal. Uh, it's called Pseudogymnoascus destructans, also known as white nose bat disease. And this attacks hibernating bats. And those bats, like during hibernation, their body temperature drops. And, and then the fungus can start taking over. But then when they wake up, which they often do in, when this fungus is attacking them, the, the, the fungus will like be beaten by the bat's immune system. But then they don't go into hibernation, and that's really bad for the bats. Bad for the bats. That's a so the, the bats are able to fight this fungus off. The fungus cannot infect them. Uh, they 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 have infected them. Then they wake up, and then like they still have the infection. But if they stay awake and like have their body temperature to back to normal for long enough, often the fungus goes away. But then it's winter, and there's not enough food for them. That's the reason why they hibernate, and then they still. They're still not healthy. So I think it killed like over 20 million bats or something since 2012. I, I forget, wow. I forget the exact <clears throat> numbers, probably more now since I looked into it. But yeah, like that's like the only fungal disease that like really gets mammals and like a deep tissue course. Like we have fungal diseases that attack us. Like I think everybody knows of um, um name is blanking candida <laughs> candida candida yeah. right we, we, we've all heard of candida of like our athlete's foot these things that like um like attack our skin because they're not as warm that's also a more vulnerable part of our bodies you can get aspergillosis which is a fungus growing in your lungs also because it's kind of in and slash out of your body but like you it you have to really do something very interesting to get like fungi growing in your system and it often indicates an unhealthy immune system. Hmm. But we have a the micro gut biome. Is that doesn't that consisted of quite a bit of fungi or no? Yes, actually, like there's a lot of fungi, mainly yeasts uh, that are in the gut biome. But the gut is interesting, right? Because it's technically it's like physically inside of our body, but the gut lining is the same cell structure as your skin. So it's kind of also outside of your body. So it's not being attacked by your immune system. So it's like fungi can survive the heat, although they don't generally like it. But then if they also get attacked by your immune system, they generally always lose. Wow. Well, yeah, but like yeah. taking over our brain, <laughs> I don't see happening at all. Although there are some interesting ideas. And I think this is more of a, a virus, like this thing that like attacks mice and it makes them attracted to cats and the cat urine oh the toxoplasma to be eaten. toxoplasma yes. right and like that's supposed to be able, able to get like in inside of us that is wild I, I i did quite a bit of research on that years ago um there's a documentary on discovery that i i helped make that's about this subject where it this toxoplasma it usually infects rodents and it has to do with cats, but it gets in the ocean and it infects seals and dolphins. All these seals are washing up on the beach and their brain is completely infected with this toxoplasma. And it does infect humans too. Uh, that's why pregnant women are supposed to stay away from kitty litter. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a weird, there's an odd connection between being interested in dangerous activities and having this toxoplasma in you so it makes you want to drive really fast it infects uh, primates um, monkeys show that they're attracted to leopards so who knows what's controlling our brain you know uh, i that's that's the big question for now fungi probably not fungi specializing on insects most likely not but I thought the premise was uh, like super creative and like the clickers are such a cool concept. And it's like uh, in the video game, you had to like also dodge the spores, which I always thought was super fun. And like, yeah, there's a I thought that like the team did an amazing job at like creating that scene. And like, what if the zombie apocalypse is is this? And then it's just so funny that now the whole thing is like, oh, people now are more scared of mushrooms. I'm like, 
what really this is this is kind of silly <laughs> yeah there there does seem to be a, a fear around mushrooms and i've heard people like paul stamets talk about this fear i think it's called mycophobia it well, is mycophobia yeah where, where do you think yeah. that comes from well i think mycophobia is cultural right like there's like it, mycophilia mycophobia especially culturally it was first coined by uh valentina pavlona guerkin and uh, her partner which is probably more famous uh, uh gordon wasson uh, some the original ethno mycologists some people call them and she was russian right so she was super into mushrooms and he was like raised in new york and he was like oh this is scary this is dangerous and i think on a cultural level like uh europeans and european descendants just like western europeans i must say because uh eastern europeans still have that mycophilia like lost that knowledge and it's it's hard to say there's some people that say that it has to do with the witch trials and just like kind of eradicating the 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 more magic like practicing wisdom keepers during the deep European dark ages. Like there's an argument that like Caesar's eradication of the, um, the Druids and the, the Celts ha like had to do with like some of that loss of knowledge because in the end fear is only not understanding something, right? If you're not right. on, like, if you don't know what mushrooms can kill you and which ones you can eat yet, then is, there's a good reason to be scared of them. Um, I don't know if the mycophobia increased because people now think that they can become zombies if, if they get close to any cordyceps or ophiocordyceps or other entomopathogenic fungi. I, I don't know. I think actually the interest in cordyceps is increasing massively right now, especially cordyceps militaris and probably also ophiocordyceps sinensis, which is the caterpillar fungus, which I don't think most people can afford on a to take on a large scale but like yeah i think the the interest in medicinal or functional mushrooms are is is increasing and cordyceps is you know it's promises are great you get more energy more power in the bedroom uh better lung capacity a lot of people um noted uh an increase in um uh, like uh, getting better from COVID and like feeling more lung capacity with working with cordyceps. So like mycophobia is still a thing. I think it's changing. Like I think a lot of people are really getting like mushrooms are just exploding right now. And like, I think they'll just keep exploding. Yeah, they really are. It seems like a, a lot of people are switching away from coffee and they're going to the mud water and Tons mm. of people are supplementing lion's mane and reishi and um, it, it's supposed to have all these brain benefits. So I guess let's transition. I would love to know how you developed this interest in mushrooms. Where did that start? Um, like most people that are into mushrooms and like, uh, this is also funny because most, most mycologists just get into it through psychedelics and a lot of them used to like hide it for years like no no no, this is just an academic interest but in reality i spoke to a bunch of, like quite a bit of them and most just got into it because of the psychedelic aspect uh, including myself um i had some truffles which are the psychedelic uh, sclerotia you can buy in stores and um i had a very tiny amount had a good experience and then I had a large amount. I had a very good experience and I kind of just got like into them and I kept, I used to buy them in the stores. Right. And like, they're not super cheap. I think a dose is like 13, 13 euros. Maybe it's a little bit more now. Um, but I was sharing with my friends who were, who didn't work. So like I already had a job at 16. So like I, I had some money. So I used to buy them. Uh, for some of my friends, it was kind of expensive. And then I, I visited one of my older friends and he had like a mushroom grow kit. So in the Netherlands, you can also buy like a ready-made grow kits for, for mushrooms. And it was just full on flushing. And I was like, whoa, this is great. And as the Dutch archetype, I asked like, how much did that cost you? <laughs> and like, it was the price of like three 
three three doses basically so i was like okay well i like i i did some quick calculation it's like this is way more uh economically <laughs> viable uh so i bought the the grow kit and then i found out that i was buying grain spawn and then i found on the shroomery that i can just add that to coco core and then it can even have more substrate and then i have more mushrooms and and then like i i, I was hooked just to see the process was just like baffling and amazing and i i did it first under the my 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 beds in, in my parents house behind some other i think it was like boxes of comic books or something <laughs> uh and then like i um like i i heard like you had to keep them in the dark so even then i when i got my own place i uh i uh kept them under my bed because it was the darkest place so that was a little thing i had and uh yeah that's that's how it got started and then i uh i think i saw the first TED talk paul stamets did and i was like got more into the the rest of the mycology and then i started to travel the world and then I started foraging for like I spent a lot of time around the equator and you just have like sloth peak events and other psychedelic mushrooms grow year round and uh spent a lot of time in like Australia and like found a bunch of books on mycology. So slowly and surely I just started to like accumulate interest and knowledge and the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn and just still happening. <laughs> <clears throat> That's amazing. So so that one initial mushroom experience led you to be a teacher in guatemala yeah i guess yeah. you could you could say it like that it, it led me to do a lot of other things in life as well but yeah eventually that led me here i uh I, if, if you would ask me even just after that like what i would be that that would not be the thing because <laughs> you were you were in like corporate sales right yeah so i i tried getting a regular human life for a while and tried doing the whole bachelor thing and um, which uh didn't really work out and and then i was a little lost for a while i have I like it, the netherlands schooling system is very different but i have a different degree which is in the netherlands is the one thing you get under a bachelor anyhow so i have that thing and like i had like a um just a, a regular sales job for a while and then i went back to like this uh student job i did and like as i i got to be a manager and the office group pretty fast it was face-to-face -face marketing so it's like a not door to door but like like my team and i used to be on the streets just talking to people and getting them to sign up for greenpeace and hello fresh and this kind of oh, thing oh wow <laughs> i remember and, that uh, I was running this office with my friend and we like grew the office to be like 110 people or something. So it was going pretty well. So here at my life, I had like lots of friends. I had like a pretty easy job. I just showed up and like trained some people and like did some hiring and some admin and we played a lot of FIFA at the office. <laughs> pretty, pretty chill for like a 20, 21 year old. I think I was at the time. And um it just didn't feel like it still felt like a deep part of my soul wanted something more and um i was still really into recreational substance use like psychedelics but mm. like i was also like <clears throat> in the netherlands basically everybody does like mdma um so i was go to a lot of parties and i like I, my favorite psychedelic to go to a party with was 2cb because it's like, for me, there was always less chance of having a challenging experience, but also uh, it's the psychedelic that I can have be in a pretty open, connected state. But if somebody that's not in that psychedelic state, I can still connect with them. What it's, What it's, is uh, 2CB? I've, I've heard of it, but I'm not really familiar with it. It's a fentyl thiophamine, which is, I, I believe, in the same category as mescaline uh, that was first synthesized uh, by Alexander Shulgin. So the whole 2C family, he first synthesized so 2CB, 2CI, and 2CE. Where, where does it come from? He synth it's, it's it's chemical. So oh, it's, it's just, that's it's it. completely lab grown or lab created. Lab grown, that's it. Wow. Yeah, it was in the mind of this crazy, amazing chemist, Alexander Shulgin. And like he, he like alchemized it into reality. 
it's an alchemical concoction. Oh. I think that's a good way to call it. <laughs> um, huh. Yeah, like uh, with, with the psychedelic scene exploding in the United States, I bet you it's like going to be everywhere, like really fast. It, it's it's very easily accessible. And it's um, it's interesting. It, like, it, the thing I don't like about it so much right now is that it like, like with mushrooms or with LSD, you kind of have this afterglow. Right? It's like, oh, wow, I just went through this. With two C, the 2C family, it just you snap and it's like you blink and it's like, wait, I'm just completely sober right now. Huh. It's is very it legal? interesting. It was legal until the early 2000s. Hmm. And now it's uh, illegal, but still very easily obtainable. I feel like they keep inventing new drugs every time they make something illegal. They kind of create some new slightly altered compound and then that's legal for a few years. And then, you know, the, the law is always a few years behind the new cutting edge thing. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like... um uh, a really good book, uh, Drug Use for Grownups, uh, Carl Hart actually talks about one of my favorites, 6APB. It used to go by the name of Benzo Fury, which like I used to just buy in store still. Hmm. Um, but like the, it's like kind of a better version of MDMA. <laughs> yeah, Nobody it's funny. It. <clears throat> you're, you're reminding me of my, my youth when I went to the Netherlands when I was 18. I kind of forgot about that trip naturally, but... Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, because everything was illegal in America. I went there when I was 18 and it's just, it's like an overload and you can definitely know who the tourists are because they're the ones that are abusing everything. And it's kind of ironic because I feel like the locals in the Netherlands, they're, they're not as excited about cannabis, no, so these like, things because it's legal. So first of all, like the lo like locals also know is like you don't go walk through like the busiest city in the Netherlands high on like a psychedelic that's just not a thing you do um but also there's just what what you're saying because it's legal there's not as much interest can like i think most people know that cannabis has been legal in the Netherlands or like uh, it's complicated not necessarily legal but like allowed in the Netherlands since the 70s like statistically, like way less people in the Netherlands smoke than in the United States. I think it's something crazy that like the la I, it's been a while since I've looked at these numbers, but like I think only like thirty percent of Dutch people have even tried cannabis in their lives, and I think fifteen or thirteen or something are like regular users. Well, in the United States, it was like when I looked at these numbers, it was like eighty percent had tried it in their lives, and wow. like something like thirty forty percent are regular users. It's like really high. Yeah, um, I think that's that's part of human nature is we want to do what we can't do. You know, like yeah. you think oh, about Adam sure. and Eve, they're the first people uh -huh. ever, according to the Bible. And like, what's the first thing they do? They eat the fruit that they they're not allowed to eat. <laughs> that's it. That's the first principle. That's the first like core value of humans <laughs> is we want to do what we can't do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, um, yeah, like with the the research like alchemical concoctions it sounds so much better research alchemy sounds so much better than research chemicals right <laughs> um yeah like it's 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 interesting what like comes up and also this whole debate of like natural versus not natural and all that but i was telling a story i just remembered because i okay so i was into 2cb right and like right now if i cared about my self-image and to be seen as a spiritual person or something i'd be like i had a self-ceremony but in reality i was just like like had nothing to do on a thursday night or something and decided to eat some psychedelics and play video games by myself uh so there i was just like doing my thing and like playing video games while contemplating life and suddenly out of nowhere i heard this like voice that was my own voice, but it didn't come from myself like it normally does, right? It felt like an outer thing. Some people call it the higher self or like, like uh, I kind of see it as my future voice, whatever that might mean. And like, it just said like two words, ha reise, which means go travel. And that was clear as day. So um, like the, the next moment I gave my job, my two month notice, I, I, I bought my tickets to thailand one way and i was like i'll just be gone for six months see what happens and then i was gone for like two and a half years or something 
Wow, and then I was that's, like, I don't, that's amazing. I don't want to be in the Netherlands, and I, 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 I never lived there for longer than three months since. Wow, that that is amazing. And um, so, what are you teaching at the school these days? So, uh, we uh, we generally like our bread and butter is mushroom cultivation. So we just finished the sixth course since like two in October, one in December, then a fifth, fifth. What was the other? Thing? Oh yeah, that was the one. Okay, yeah, the fifth mushroom cultivation course since September, and so we did a, like a full on season, and yeah, it was great. We we sold out most of them. Had a bunch of students from like over like this season. I think it was over thirty five countries come and learn like the whole mushroom cultivation process A to Z. And then like we also have bit online courses, and we just launched the fungal ecology course, which is kind of more. Uh, focusing on like how fungi work in the ecosystem. So like a lot of people have maybe heard the term mycorrhizal, like tons of people have seen fantastic fungi. So you heard about mycorrhizal, uh, like the more in-depth person has maybe even heard of an endophytic fungus, right? Uh, just, just for the people that haven't heard of it, what what is mycorrhizal? Ah, that's, that's a, a good question. So myco means like, that's why it's called mycology. It means related to a fungus, right? So mucus or something used to be the ancient Greek word for spongeless fungus. And so myco and then rhizal means that it's related to roots. And that's also from the Greek or Latin words for roots. So a fungus that relates to roots. And which is very interesting because mo most, if not all plants have some form of mycorrhizal relationship with these fungi. There's actually a really cool little fact that like, we have fossil evidence of the first mycorrhizal fungi or the ancestor of mycorrhizal fungi as we know it today, uh, about 50 million years before we have fossil evidence of the first plants with their own roots. So they're really old. They've been there forever. Some people even would claim that fun like fungal mycelium were the roots of plants before plants evolved their own roots because of this like interesting connection in the 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 fossil uh, records but like they're they're super important they can help uh trees transport information and nutrients they they help with like the the resiliency of an ecosystem and like uh Suzanne Simmer really beautifully called it the wood white web because transformation is also being uh processed but also viruses and pathogens it's kind of like a big network of Ner nervous system of the forest you can also kind of see it as uh it's um it's it's really fascinating and like there's still so little we know about them in like the large parts like we generally study the mycorrhizal networks of trees because they're easy to find because they're big but like not just trees produce these like connections right so like every plant in the wild seems to do this every healthy plant in the wild. Yeah, I, re I remember hearing Paul Stamets talk about meadow makers in forests. And I always wondered when you're walking through a forest, it can be a really thick, dense forest. And then all of a sudden it just stops mm -hmm. and you're in a meadow and there's no trees in this meadow. And I always wondered, you know, a lot of times it's not gradual at all. It's just trees and then it stops. Mm -hmm. And I think I remember Paul was saying that the fungus or can orchestrate the environment they're like the orchestrators of of the forest yeah so Is like the 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 i i call them the the the, the orcs the directors of the orchestra of life sometimes um so this has to more to do with pathogenic fungi like for example the the fungi of the belonging to the genus armillaria which is also armillaria ostea is the largest organism that we know of today, which you can kind of like in his book, my same running, he has like this picture from the sky and you see this massive meadow. And like the whole idea behind it is like these pathogens, they kill the trees. And like over time, this makes a meadow by the trees die, they fall down. And then like for, if they have any seeds or nuts or something that would, would have fallen onto the grounds, 
like uh, those sproutlings would have been eaten, like the first. So like this this meadow then would be created by like a lot of trees dying, you're creating a large flat space for like smaller plants and like grass to grow, which grows faster than the saplings of trees. Then the deer and other grazers are attracted to these like juicy small plants that pop up, but they also eat the little um the little um tree saplings that come up because they're still juicy. And that also gives them the ability to spot predators from a like longer distance. So they feel safer being in that meadow. And by having a meadow at one moment, like there is like because of the grazers, there's a larger chance that for that meadow to stay in existence as long as the grazers stay present. That's the idea. It can also have to do something with soil though. It's like if there's not as much soil aggregate stability, so like the soil is just not firm enough for to hold a tree, like trees also don't really develop, I believe, but I'm not 100% certain on this. Oh, and do, do the meadows stay in one place forever or do the mushrooms have the ability to like move those meadows around? And like, I think we, I think you, I heard you talk about sometimes they have the ability to like, kill a plant and sometimes they have the ability to help the plant grow i think yeah. i remember you saying something like that yeah so that that's actually about the like endophytic fungi so this is a crazy one so we have never ever found a plant that does not have endophytic fungi living within them in the wild i must say there must, there's probably some fucking plant grown in space that doesn't have <laughs> endophytic fungi but like also those beautiful plants in your room I, I right there, they, they have fung fungi living inside their cells, around their cells. And we're learning so much about these endophytic fungi today, right? Like we talked about the entomopathogenic fungi just now, right? Like the, um, the oviocordyceps. But there's also like these fungi that kill insects uh, that live in the cell walls of the plant until the plant gets eaten by an insect and then it kills the insect. Like the most famous of this genus is known as uh, like uh, the this genera is the genus Metarhizium, but now it, like people are finding them like even cordyceps have uh, an endophytic stage, some of them at least, and we know now that s somehow turkey tail mushrooms and other saprophytes, so the the ones that eat the dead plant matter, also have an endophytic stage. So, like because they're such like the the hidden alchemists of the natural world, I call them they have the ability to create compounds to either support or damage the plant. So this had mainly has to do with like, if you live in, in a house, right? And like your foundation is a little broken, but it's repairable. You still have the option to repair it, right? But like, if it's like, if the plant is sick and like, there's no way this plant is going to make it, well, you're going to start thinking, it's like, okay, what can I save of this house? I'm going to tear the roof off, you know? So the fungus probably will think something very similar in this regard. If the plant is just too sick or too old or like has a massive, like important branch that broke off or like a larger tree grew above it. So it doesn't have enough, uh, the same amount of sunlight anymore. Like, I believe fungi are consciousness enough to make that decision of to cut the cord and just kind of attack the plant instead so yeah you, you could see them as balance creators but also you know like when we bring pathogenic fungi from one place of the world to the other place of the world that's really when they start going out of control a little bit because then the balance starts getting out of like like tilted to one side and i think the best example is this with um gryphonectria parasitica also known as a chestnut blight which the East Coast of the United States used to be filled with these chestnuts. Like, I think it was like three, four billion of these large trees, like the size of redwoods, basically, that also produced billions or trillions of these chestnuts that people could eat and like uh, other animals could eat. And then when like people brought in the uh, Japanese chestnut because they thought it looked cool, it started like bringing this, this fungal pathogen with it. And the Japanese chestnut has this natural resistance against that the chestnut blight, but the, the East American chestnut did not have it. And like in the 20th century and like uh, basically less than a hundred years, the East Coast lost 
all of their uh, American chestnuts. Uh, not all, there's still some alive, but they're not as prevalent as they used to be. So like, that's that's when they get out of control and they're like the directors, but they're not always like the complete bringers of balance, like sometimes they're portrayed. Yeah, I guess what I was getting at was we've talked about fungal intelligence and, you know, mm -hmm. we have this idea, this very rigid conception in our culture of what intelligence is. But if you kind of look at what mycelium do as a form of intelligence, like we've seen those videos of them solving mazes and mm -hmm. the Japanese very famously used fungi to help them map out the Tokyo uh, train system. Mm -hmm. So they used the fungi to, um, it, it sought out the food sources and they put the food sources at all the train stops. I'm, I know you've seen this. Mm -hmm. And they use the route of the fungus to be the route of their trains that they designed. And if you haven't seen those videos, we'll we'll probably include a video in this of that that maze solving. It's really amazing. I think we put it in the fungal intelligence video as well. It's a uh, Fusarium polycephalum. Um, you got these names down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, almost I... like a poetry or or different language. <laughs> these names. It's it's just that they don't have a common name. Like I think the common name might be like dog vomit slime mold or something. It's oh not my as gosh. uh but yeah, like I I, th I think I researched this one for the video and then like the name just I had to like pronounce like pronounce it correctly. For yeah, the some of these names are beautiful. The They're super beautiful. <clears throat> and like also like they all have a meaning, right? That's the cool thing about Latin. It's kind of like learning this secret language. Um which technically is not a fungus, but it's a slime mold. It's a very, it's, it's different. They're not in the same uh, queendom or kingdom of life anymore. They used to be. But yeah, it's like, that's one way of it. Like if you look at just mycelium, right? The, the network. And if you look how it branches and if you look at like our nervous system and now we know that fungi also communicate with these like electromagnetic impulses, just like our nervous system does. It's like, so we are, I think in the formal intelligence video, like I described it of this top down intelligence and bottom up, right? So we have very concentrated neurons in one spot and then a larger like network of neurons that can control this body. But like, for example, this really big um, armillaria mushroom, right? This covers like, like hectares of, of space. Like if you condense all of that mass of mycelium into a human body, you probably have more nerve neural connections. You probably have a larger like density of uh, of nervous system. So it's not that crazy to think that like they might just be as intelligent or even more intelligent just by the complete mass of like nervous system like um mycelium so you know it's it's really hard to say it's like also a gut feeling like i i, I have and a lot of other people seem to have and there is a research paper that i didn't i, I just re read the headline but there was a research paper i think it was by nicholas p money actually he's a really great he's a really great mycologist uh that showcased some fungal intelligence in mycelium but I forget really how they used to test that. So maybe we can pop that out and put it on top of that. It's like, hey, this is it. But like, yeah, I think I think we need to look wider than just like humans being intelligent. And I think we can already do that by, like if we look at dolphins or stuff, we're like, oh yeah, or whales. Yeah, of course, they're, they're also mammals and we can relate to them. But then... If you look at something else that's very intelligent, like ant or termite colonies, it's already harder for us to grasp it. Like in reality, they're just so, so good at what they're doing. And then if you ha have to look at an organism that doesn't move on the same pace that we do, that like you can only see grow if you're going in the forest on a daily basis and you see a mushroom fruit. But then like if you have, if, if you have mycelium growing on Petri dishes, that's also when you can see it grow. It's it's harder for us to have that relationship with that, I think. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, there definitely seems to be some sort of intelligence there, but it's it's so hard to put that into words. But 
when you take psychedelic mushrooms, you certainly mm -hmm. interface with that intelligence. I mean, there's a lot of geometry there. There's a lot of patterns and things that didn't make sense suddenly seem to make perfect sense. So, yeah, exactly. And maybe that's the mind controlling mushroom that now taking over the world, right? Like that's, that's a whole nother thing. It's like, Hey, it can be diabolical. Like what was portrayed in the last of us, but it's really good for like the genus philosophy that we right now, like taking a lot of mushrooms of this genus, especially philosophy cubensis. I don't know many other mushrooms that are cultivated and grown on such a large scale right now. So if that is the, the goal of the mushroom to take over our brains and doctrinate us with their agenda, well, it's, it's working. <laughs> yeah. They, they want to use us to get to space, right? That's it. That's it. That's that. That was a fun, that was a fun little video. That was great. Oh, yeah. So what, what is the process of, from the very beginning to having the fruit body mushroom, what, what is that? Take us through that process of you start, you don't have any mushrooms. What do you need to grow your own mushrooms? All right. So you don't have any mushroom. It's always easier if you have some fresh mushrooms, but like so you, you should start with some spores. You or... could like, so you can also start with liquid culture and I'm not telling anybody here to do anything illegal. But let's just say we're, we're growing completely legal mushrooms here. We're going to grow in the gonna... Netherlands. Okay, guys. Yeah, gonna we're going to grow in the Netherlands or Spain or... Well, well your school, don't you teach people how to grow like lion's mane or, or like regular culinary mushrooms for also, cooking? We also yeah. teach people how to grow philosophy cubensis and other <laughs> mushrooms of the genus philosophy. It's, it's a little vague here in Guatemala. There's no law against it. Nobody's yeah. ever been prosecuted. There's some weird umbrella laws that anything that will get you uh, intoxicated that's not alcohol can get you in trouble. But like, as long as there's no case, it's not like we're advertising it everywhere that, that uh, like in front of our door, it's like, hey, this year we like we don't produce, we don't like sell these mushrooms. We're just like, hey, it's just information, right? We just grow a bunch of mycelium. That's it. Nobody like they're not going to go like, we're going to send this to a lab and we'll find out that this is this mushroom. And, but like, let's say you, you're growing a, a salt spot. Well, there's a couple of ways, right? Like you could either start from a fresh mushroom or dehydrated mushroom. That's a little trickier, but like fresh one, pretty easy. Or you can start from spores, which a lot of people like these spore syringes, which I think is silly because that's just like, larger chance of getting contaminated i just say like start with a spore print if you can get a spore print that's probably the bet your best option but right now like there's tons of people on the internet selling philosophy cubensis liquid culture i know there's some really amazing sources on instagram there's uh, uh our friends at true blue genetics check them out if you use promo code fungi you can even get 20 percent off <laughs> they they sell them and they 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 ship them and like uh, my friend who runs it, he mentions that he actually got some sent out and that they don't like the mycelium doesn't contain any of the alkaloids that are legal. So technically it's the same as spores and there's no thing about it. So that's that's all up for debate right now. But that's why I would say, like always tell people to start because if you have to germinate from spore, it's like if you have to sprout a seed, right? How many of those seeds make it? Ugh, it's so much work. It's so annoying when you wait eight weeks and your seed didn't make it. But if you want to, if you buy it like a young lime, lime tree, you're going to have a lime tree. Like this, it's hard to, for that to mess up. So if you buy a liquid culture syringe or an agar Petri dish, you're generally in way better hands. You're also probably going to get way more fruits and you're going to have an easier time growing because somebody spent their time and energy propagating this culture. Right? So that's probably the best, the best, best. So you have this. Um, well, there's, there's many ways to go about this, but like, if you really want to get into this, I always say buy a pressure cooker. Like you can get a really fancy one, like an All-American, but you don't need that. You can just use a regular home pressure cooker that at least goes to 10 pounds of force per square inch, also known as PSI. You can just find that on the manual, how high to go. I think even we always get this question, Instapots or something. Seems to be a popular thing in the United States. I think they go to like 11 PSI, so they, they could work. And then you need to sterilize some grains. And it doesn't really matter what kind of grains. We use 
sorghum or millet. People use popcorn, uh, rye, rye berries, whole, whole oats seem to work as well. And you sterilize those. You cook them first and then you sterilize them by putting them in the pressure cooker for, depending on the pressure cooker, depending on the pressure for an X amount of time at 15 PSI that we use, uh, we like an hour and a half for medium to large jars, like one hour, 15 minutes for smaller jars is fine. And then you need to like somehow get this mycelium that you either have on an agar plate or a petri dish or like a um, liquid culture inside of your grains, right? So um, you need to create a sterile like environment for most of it. You can kind of skip that if you have liquid culture. Like there's so much to go into it, man. Like we, we teach this for a whole week. So I'm trying to make it this. <laughs> uh, it's, I try not to get into the weeds too much. But like you can either get like a laminar flow hood, which is really fancy. Uh, but you can also just get a plastic see-through box, cut some holes in it, spray it like with a literal fuck ton of uh, isopropyl 70% alcohol and bleach it, wait till it's dried up. And then put the box upside down so you can work inside this box. This is called a steel air box. And then you, if you're careful enough, you can open stuff and like there's a pretty significant chance that like it's going to be good and that you're not going to contaminate your grains. And then you need like something like a knife so, for a scalpel. <clears throat> contamination is a huge issue, right? Yeah, like, because you, you want to work with like mycelium can grow with other things around it, but like you generally want to grow only the mycelium that you want to grow in it. So for a lot of people, if you're careless or you try to cut corners or you're just sloppy in your work, you're going to see contamination. And this can be bacteria that come in and this can be yeast. Especially grain is really, really hard. That's why like with liquid culture, in theory, you can just sterilize some sugar water and you, you make a little hole in your lid. And then with silicone, you make a self-healing port and you make a little hole for it to air out of. And then you cover that with like sports tape or something. I forget what it's called. Um, there's also this company, Micropose, that does all of these products that you can uh, make that with yourself. They're called like adapted mushroom cultivation lids. You can probably find that on the internet or in our course. Of course, you can also get the mushroom cultivation course. But uh, <laughs> um, the, the main thing is that like opening stuff is really bad. So with liquid culture, you can just squirt a little bit of this liquid culture that you bought in a syringe into some cold sterilized sugar water that you cool down. And then you can like pull more syringes out and you never have to open these grain jars or you have to never, in theory, never have to work with the sterile condition. And therefore you reduce your uh, contamination because you never have to open the jars that you are trying to move the mycelium from one jar to another with. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking about my experience growing them and how I didn't do all these steps. So I was like, oh my gosh, maybe that's why it didn't come out right. But you had some, you had some it, growing, right? It, it, a little bit grew. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. It was very rewarding. That's that, that's the main thing of it. Right. So like that's one way. And then you have, let's say everything correctly. And you have a, gr a jar full of like nicely myceliated grains. And then you give that to some coconut core and some vermiculite and gypsum that you pasteurize by pouring some hot water over it and letting it sit until it cools down. And coconut core is, is that from coconut? Yeah, that's coconut husk. Then they blend and cook. Like I think they put it in the oven to sterilize it. So that coconut husk makes really good soil. Yeah. So people use it hmm. for seedlings because it's not like there's no other like tiny seeds and stuff in there. But the my like the mycelium loves it. It's like you can use manure, but like it's if you live in a city, it's hard to get manure. It stinks if it's yeah. not like processed properly. And then there's the chance that works. there's some other contaminant in the manure, right? Yeah. Well, if you live near, like I grew up near a horse ranch, and uh, so I I used to just go and like, hey, can I get some of your manure? And they're like, sweet. And it was like people that like just fed their horses organic stuff and 
it was always great so i got it for free um but like you could like if you have access right coco core you can just go to a store get a pound of coco core and you can have enough substrate for a while do, do you now make your own stuff from scratch i don't i can't imagine you're going to a store and getting this stuff no well so <laughs> Uh, there's actually a company here that um, makes coconut core and like uh, they deliver. So there's a, a, a little dirt road that goes by our property and like we can get stuff delivered. It's not as easy. We don't have Amazon or anything. You don't have but Amazon. Like, yeah, don't have Amazon. But I, like, I, I kind of envy you. Every time we talk, I, I'm like, you know, how you were talking about you want something more from life. I'm always like, wow, it would be fun to just drop everything and go live in Guatemala in the jungle. I got to visit try you. it out. You can just come for a month, come hang out, come yeah. around <laughs> October. It was like go mushroom hunting every day. Well, if, if, if you, you people out there, if you never see any more after school videos, you know where I am. That's it. If, if well, after school this, ends. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. We also have a nice, pretty nice studio here. And like, as you can see, the internet seems to be working. So. You don't yeah, have I've never everything. seen this part of your your property. You're usually out in the jungle when we talk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, like if I'm on my phone, it's easier. But like I, I just got this pretty new, new nice mic, and I was like, well, I'm gonna go onto the, the is it after school before school podcast. You know, well, this is episode two, <laughs> so I really, you know, I'm not super committed to any name. Well, the, the funny thing is that uh, episode one, I was kind of forced into, or I was pushed into doing, not forced against my will, but um, do you know who Rashad Evans is? Yeah, I know. UFC. Uh, I know J Jake Plummer actually took our course. Yeah, he has this awesome mushroom company called uh, Umbo. Umbo, yeah. And I've, I've been eating the lion's mane bars. They give you a lot of energy. But episode one was Rashad Evans. And he was like, let's do a podcast. And I'm like, I don't have a podcast. He's like, well, then make <laughs> one. And, you know, you can't say no to the UFC champion. That's so I was like, all right, we'll do episode one. So this is episode two. And yeah, I'm just, we have great conversations. So I thought, let's turn it into some sort of podcast. That was great, man. Like, yeah, like I think it's absolutely, you're like, you have so many epic people working on your like videos and like with, with you and like you can just also have like more in-depth in-depth things you know i'd love to see your conversations with like randall carlson or graham hancock or jordan peterson and ryan yeah Marescu, thank you all those thank, i mean i was literally just talking to brian Morescu like a few minutes ago solid so he'll be he'll be guest three hopefully oh amazing it's gonna be a mushroom focused podcast that's great that's great yeah. So, so let, let, let's finish this train of thought, right? Yes. We're at the yes. Grain farm. Sorry. So I then keep you prepare the you. substrate, and then like you get like, which is called a monotub, which is basically a plastic box, which is a little bit smaller than the steel air box. And you also make some holes in it. They're also a little bit smaller, because mushrooms just like us need to breathe in oxygen and they exhale carbon dioxide. And then you mix this grain spawn with the substrate that you just pasteurized and then you let that sit for two weeks until it's all fully myceliated and then you give it some some air and you're gonna have mushrooms you make it sound so easy <laughs> in, in reality it's pretty easy there's there's some details to it right and there's some fine tuning so do you for you me this, this always a... comes super easy to me i i suck at gardening man i killed wow. so many plants in my life <laughs> <laughs> it, is it it's a lot different than gardening huh i think it's a little bit more you know gardening is you can kind of do on a feeling basis and like oh you have to like nurture them a little bit every day and like my silly is like you do one day of work and then you let it sit for a couple days and then like you check up on it and it's, it's a little difference but like the sterile work is that's just the big difference but like in it, it feels very intimidating but once you got the hang of it it's not that not that crazy it's so amazing because one day there's nothing 
And then you walk out the next day and all of a sudden it's just like an explosion of mushrooms. Yeah. It happens so fast. So fast. Yeah. I've got these, um, I've got all these kits in my house where you kind of, they're just really easy. You just spray them with water and then the yeah. mushrooms come out. It's funny because people know that I like mushrooms. So every time Christmas comes around or my birthday, the gift everybody gives me is is mushroom related. So that's why I have mushroom pants on, mushroom shirt, mushroom <laughs> shoes. Uh, <laughs> but I, I can't complain. I, I do love the gifts. But for Christmas, I got stacks of these boxes people sent me where you just spray water on them and then the mushrooms come out and they're so easy and it is really cool like we had these pink oyster mushrooms they're they get massive and yeah. they look like underwater coral mm -hmm. really cool and then so all the oysters grew super fast and then i had uh some lion's mane and that didn't grow but i kept spraying it for like two months nothing happened and then I, I went out of town for a week last week didn't spray it with any water or anything and i come home and it just exploded and there it is so you never know like maybe that's why people are kind of afraid of them because they are so mysterious one day there's nothing there and then the next day everything's exploded and then a day later they're all gone mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah they're not around long enough for us to really get familiar with them that's it like they're they're an enigma in many senses <clears throat> So we are having a, a record year in California. We're having the most rain we've had in decades. I heard. And there's supposed to be this record um, blossoming of mushrooms across the state right now. And uh, I've been meaning to go out and forge, but we don't have many forests down here in San Diego. Just like put it in your calendar, man. It's like block it off. It's like, <laughs> I'm going to go drive. Just, you know, have you heard of iNaturalist? It's great. Oh, yeah, the, the app? Yeah, so you yeah. go and you look like, you, I think there's a map view of all the sightings and you just go and you just like go find where most people have been sighting mushrooms and you just go to that forest. You just drive there. doesn't wow. matter. And then like you just block off two days or a day and you just go out and you find them. I'm going to do that. Yeah, and then like if if you find something cool you don't know, you can send it to me, or you can like put it on iNaturalist, and then probably Alan Rockefeller, who's this really epic, like field mycologist, <laughs> he will probably answer you. He has like, I think over a million identifications or something on this wow. platform. He's amazing. He's just on there all day identifying. Basically, yeah, that's, that's that's amazing. Like he does, like he makes pictures, and then like he identifies mushrooms for himself and for other people. Okay, I have another question. Yeah. <clears throat> so there, there is this hype around psilocybin right now. It's being tested all over the place for mental yes. health issues. And it's really exciting. But mm -hmm. do you think, how do you think we should approach this? Do you, do you think there should be some caution or? So first of all, I think it's really funny that like people call it like, and I, I do this as well because it's the lingo that we're using right now. It's like, I like that you said psychedelic mushrooms because I think it's like way more an umbrella term. We call, refer to them as sacred mushrooms. A lot of people call them psilocybin mushrooms, which is funny because psilocybin doesn't do anything for our brain. Zero. Really? No, it gets converted into psilocin. And that does the thing. But nobody calls it psilocin mushrooms. Psilocin is the one thing that's actually doing it but why the focus is on psilocybin is because it's way more stable so that 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 aside right like I, I just think that's 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 a funny way of like how it appeared because like for example like when Albert Hoffman synthesized psilocybin like that became popular and that becomes popular because you, you can make I think it's a pill if he synthesizes it and it's, it will stay stable for quite a bit of time but if he would synthesize psilocin like he needs to vacuum seal it and needs to make sure that there's no air exposure because it just breaks down. So that that's the one, the one <laughs> little kicker I start off with. I think it's, we're li living in interesting times and I think it throws challenging times and we're all looking for a silver magic bullets. And I, I think sacred mushrooms are very promising but like we also like when people say stuff like 
oh, these mushrooms are going to save the world. They're going to make everybody happier and better. I think we're also like not learning from our history. Like, for example, here in Mesoamerica, right? Like the Mexica, also known as the Aztecs, they, they, they ate a lot of these mushrooms. And they also had like, like ritual sacrifice and uh, cannibalism. And they were like obsessed with warfare and like, like take like colonizing uh, other indigenous people. Like this is a thing we can't forget, right? Like when people say, oh, I think that these mushrooms make better people. I, I don't agree. I, I like, I think if they can give us lessons that are so deep and personal that with the right tool set and with the right community, I think they can actually make us better people, but I don't think it's a, like definitive thing and i think the hyper focus on on just these mushrooms are going to just make us better people well you've been in the psychedelic space for a while i've been in the psychedelic space for almost 12 years now and uh i i gotta tell you i met a ton of people with psychedelic induced uh, ego inflation <laughs> mm. <laughs> and like that's also real like people that have one of these journeys or like have an ayahuasca journey is like I'm I've met God and God told me I have this super special path and I'm just so special and amazing. You know, like is that like a trait of a better person? I don't really know. Um like would I think it's better if uh for example our our leaders would like work with these mushrooms as, or like other psychedelics as well? I think I think in the right set and setting, surrounded by the right people, yes. Like I'm pretty sure that like some sharks around the world have taken these mushrooms are surrounded by other sharks. And then like, it's just confirmation bias, right? Like you're just like, we're, we're influenced by the people that we surround ourselves with. That's just a given. Right. And like, if those people are like kind, caring, nice people, like we'll be kinder and caring and nice with the legalization aspect. One thing is just like, just again, not being from the United States and this whole like scene being so focused on the United States and a little bit of Canada right now, the, the whole cannabis market wanting to go into it. People making gummies is just like, to me, it's just silly. Like, wait, you want to have a potentially life changing experience and you want to dump a bunch of sugar into that. To me, it's just weird. I just don't, I would never understand that. And like the whole commodification of it. I'm not a fan, but like, I'm also like, yo, if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. You know, I'm like, I'm not here to, uh, to hold anybody back, but I just don't, don't think this is the way. And I don't think this is how we're gonna, like a way that we can look at this thing as a sacrament, which I think it, it is, you know, it's a, like the, my most life-changing experiences I have been in a very intentional way. And like, although when I was younger, I didn't know how to make an intentional way, but like, I want to, like I said, sp a space to have a deep journey that, that can be intentional already instead of like, I'm just going to pop this gummy and see what happens. And yeah. Anyway, I think that's, that's interesting. And I think that's also where like when the cannabis came, like industry came in, like, like this train name started exploding and now you have all this fucking crazy shit that like, some bro somewhere in California came up with. And I'm like, it's also lots of big events. And I have a couple of presentations on why this doesn't really matter. And I think this whole, like people wanting specific strains or saying that this strain will give you this effect. This strain will give you that effect. Like I asked most cultivators, um, if I give you three blind samples, are you able to tell which is which? And nobody, nobody, nobody knows. Hmm. No, nobody would be like, oh yeah, hundred percent. Well, if I ask somebody that's uh, quote unquote a connoisseur, if I give you a, bl a blind sample of uh, uh, three different species of psilocybe, right? So psilocybe semilanciata, which is the liberty cap, psilocybe cyanescence, which is the wavy cap, and psilocybe cubensis, would you be able to tell the difference? I think I could. I think like a lot of people could. So I think that's way more where we have to go in different species instead of just like some weird stuff names that are made up by some some bro hmm. cultivators in the because <laughs> when i States. when i grew it i i grew penis envy which, which everybody is super excited about sure and and b plus plus 
And they looked very different to me. Like they just looked very different. Oh, they looked different. Yeah. The B plus plus was very much like a body feeling. Mm -hmm. And that uh, the penis envy was incredibly visual. Mm -hmm. And I I, maybe it's all placebo. Maybe it's placebo. You know? Did somebody tell you? Oh, the B positive. That's like it's it's. I think it's supposed to be said called B positive, not Mm. B plus, but B positive plus. be double positive um did somebody tell you oh this is going to be more of a body high i pr- they probably did because you know yeah i that's have the thing We're there so is something to that if you tell somebody what the experience is going to be like that really informs the experience for instance oh, like 100 percent. you know i i've i've given the exact same thing to two friends on a camping trip and i told one this is just going to make you laugh and I told the other one, this is going to make you figure out your life. And one guy was just sitting there like in a deep meditation, like figuring out his life. And the other guy was just hitting a tree with a stick, like giggling. <laughs> and I'm like, huh, that's it. Maybe. No, no, hundred percent, man. We're like so easily primed. And like, I think I'm happy that you did this experiment and you find this, found this out because not a lot of people do this. I've done this as well. Giving people the exact same mushroom told them different things and like like it's it's it, it's the story like if these stories serve us if you really want to tell yourself that like be positive is more body and like lighter and more beginner friendly and penis envy which is again like who the fuck ever named like such a mushroom it's anyhow yeah, you don't forget a name like that <laughs> you don't forget a name yeah. like that and like yeah there is a there's a chance that these mushrooms uh, like from the same cultivator which is known this like this culture is known as a um, a cultivar if it's from one specific individual that they have very similar effects um but like also what not a lot of people know is that the mushrooms grown from the same genetics with the same substrate with the same growing conditions at the same time of year in one in the same box, the same container can have wildly differentiating uh, alkaloids contents. Well, what does that mean? They look okay, different, so, or uh, no, no. So the what when it looks different is phenotypical differences. But like, let's say I I grow um, let's say I grow some albino penis envies, right? And like I grow this this from the same genetics, this the genetics that I've propagated over. Many generations, I've to pay, put a lot of care in it. I over, always select it from the strongest, uh, most big, beautiful mushrooms. So I know what the source is, right? And um, I, I grow them in one box. And what mushroom A can have double the amount of psilocybin and psilocin than mushroom B. And this is the same genetic, same growing conditions, all of that. And that's from the same grower. So what happens, and this is what's happening with strains, is if I, uh, you said you didn't have so much success, I, I give you a petri dish of this culture. And like six months later, like you also, like you've uh, stumbled around with it a little bit. You've not given it the right food sources. It's not as happy as it was in the hands of a more experienced cultivator. And you grow the same mushrooms. Do like, do you think that even though they carry the same name and that they might look the same, that they're going to be the same in potency and experience? Uh, not necessarily. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So like what, what's been happening with these strains is like somebody in, in originally, and especially like talk about like penis envy, which is pretty old. Like this has been handed down so many times. Like you don't even know who's grown them, that they look the same and that they might have the same name. Doesn't mean that they have the same character and the same constituents. So that that's a really hmm. important thing to know. So that's why for me to focus, I think it just like because just the cannabis industry is so obsessed, which is like with cannabis, like you could argue that like connoisseurs can taste the difference between these different strains. And they sure, like I'm not against that, but like I don't think it's a copy paste on mushrooms, what people are trying to do. And they look different. I do agree. Yeah. They look different, yeah. but like humans also look very different and we are very uh like in the core we are very similar depends yeah, it's, it's like almost where like... we've grown up and like where are we coming from 
but in right. the end, we're all human. It's like you can have two you have siblings in the same house with the same genes they grew up with the same parents same environment but they can grow up to be two drastically different people exactly that so as well mushrooms yeah. prove themselves again to be very similar to humans uh-huh very similar and like i, I do want to say right like there's if you always get the the same mushroom from the same grower there's a very good likelihood that they're going to be having a similar experiences right but just the name doesn't mean that the it's a, a brand like a staple of like this is a good thing because they're all going to be the same that's that's a little bit my my point i'm trying to make but maybe Cube's we're cute. trying to you know use that name to inform the experience you know oh my god that's we're going to do this name we're going to have this experience that's it and like i always say is like th when people ask me when i um uh, like in the Netherlands when like I uh, hand out some mushrooms and uh, somebody asked me, it's like, what strain is this? Like, this is the, exactly the best thing that you're going to need right now. Do you need to laugh? You're going to laugh. Do you need to think about life? You're going to think about life. This is what you need. But and no, <laughs> Jasper, I want you to tell me what it is. <laughs> <laughs> huh. no, yeah, not, uh, somehow I, I don't know if that answer is going to be satisfactory. <laughs> That's it. I want and you like, to tell me that this is the exact strain that's going to make me have the time, the time of my life. What do you want to get out of it? <laughs> yeah. I want to laugh. Okay. That's going to make you laugh. Easy. <laughs> so you're coming to America soon. Yes. So nothing is on paper yet. I think they're really busy, but like there's like 95% certainty that I'm going to be speaking at lightning in a bottle festival. Amazing. I've uh, painted at that festival many times. I, I heard and like I saw and then I also just saw that Paul Stamets is going to be returning. So that might be. Oh, fun. my gosh. Maybe I should go back. I'm jealous. Tom, it's going to be fun. We're going to have such yeah. a good time. But have a you bunch met of the Paul? Fungi crew is coming. I have never met Paul before. So I think this is going to be the first time. That's great. Yeah. He's super nice. I heard. Yeah. 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 Like I've gotten inspired to me deeply. a couple times. So I'm uh, I'm stoked to uh, to meet in the flesh. We've done something together with Paul and Fungi Cam before, so yeah, maybe he knows who I am. He's kind of like a celebrity in the space now. You know, when people I think mention... he's kind of like out of the mushroom space now and more in the celebrity everywhere else, more psychedelic focused space. Yeah, he's really doing some amazing work with uh, bees and pushing certain legislation, and he's. He's doing good work, it seems like. Yeah, I think so. I think there's some valid criticisms, especially from the mycological community. What are that, the criticisms? Um, so like, I think his uh, like argument for patents is interesting. He just patented like the Stamet stack, so combining lion's mane and psilocybin, which I think is it's like okay, these two mushrooms are the current the wild. And Does that mean nobody else can put those two in just, a product? Or? He's just preparing for when it's legal that he's the only one. Hmm. And the other criticism is um, the mycelium on grain that his company is selling, which, uh, well, now we're at it, is also what's in Modwater's product. It's uh, <clears throat> mycelium grown on grain, which doesn't have much mycelium and it doesn't seem to have the beneficial compounds in the high as the high quantity as the actual mushroom fruiting body um so, so you're in the fruit body camp i think okay so the the fungus creates this beautiful offering to the animal kingdom for us to consume and interact with and we're trying to dig out the mycelium like I'm I'm happy to actually go into this, but like the main argument that they make is that mycelium is the defense system, sure, in the wild, but the, the mycelium that they're growing are is in sterile conditions. So is that really is that argument still really like valid if the mycelium is not needing to defend itself? So yeah, I guess we should maybe back up and just explain this whole. There's a division in the mushroom community, and I didn't know that this was like. It's like Republicans versus Democrats. <laughs> it's like 90% of the my, people that are into the mushrooms are on one side and the people that have businesses on 
that sell people uh, mushrooms grown on grain, mycelium on mushrooms. That's a very big difference, actually. Uh, mycelium grown on grain, which is way cheaper to produce a lot of mass, mm. which is, again, the, the whole thing is like, okay, that's, that's interesting, right? Are on the other side. Because there's no way to extract that mycelium off the grain. There's no way to separate no. it, right? And also, you, like, again, it, they're, they're companies, right? So they want to sell more products. So why did they want to take out the So it's much more grain? difficult to get it to that fruit body stage. There's no fruit body. Like some, if yeah. it says full spectrum, they just let it pin. So the first like young fruit bodies come out, but then there's still a whole issue with chitin and it not really being digested by the body. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's interesting because of course people get like heated about this. Like I don't have a medicinal mushroom company. I, I just have taken medicinal mushrooms extracted and I may do that here for myself and my community. And I've had like mycelium grown on grain, which I've also done myself. And I had products from other companies and it just doesn't hit the same. Hmm. And then I've also done like seen tests of individuals that have only worked with fruit, but like mushroom extracts. And, and like, it, it just shows that you're just getting a higher concentration of the, the alkaloids and the compounds that you're looking for. If you're working with a mushroom extract. And then the whole thing is that like the the false marketing also like goes in wrong holes with people because all of their products will say mushroom well it has zero mushrooms in it so that's kind of it's mm. it's kind of like uh it's really good marketing right I I gotta admit it's great marketing but I think from like actually getting medicine to the people mm. I, there's a yeah. That's an interesting point because, yeah, when you when you think of mushrooms, you think of a mushroom that's out of the ground and, you know, that's, that's kind of already nature's gift. You're going to eat that. But it's hard to wrap your mind around digging up the earth and finding that little mycelium and then grinding that up and putting it into a, a capsule or something and calling that a mushroom. Yeah. Yeah. It's no, different. exactly. It's very different. And then like the the main thing around it is like, if if the marketing around it was more honest and it wasn't the same like that it's the price that it is which is fairly high generally it's kind of funny because uh i can produce a pound of mycelium grown on grain here a pound right for like one and a half dollars in the States, it's even cheaper because grains here are expensive. And so how much would a pound of, of mushroom fruit body cost you to oh, make? Oh, way more. Like 10 like, times more? Probably. Maybe even 15. So it's a it's a strictly, it's a business. It's a great business advantage to, to do the mycelium route. Yes. So hmm. there's another thing. If the argument would be that like you're like, oh, mycelium is better for people, which I get. There are ways to make hundred get hundred percent pure mycelium, which you can grow it in liquid bioreactors. Which, if you have uh, enough m money, that I assume some of these companies do have have, you can like it's not that expensive or difficult. You just have it's more work. It's probably a little bit more expensive. Um. But yeah, it's 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 you just don't get the same weight, right? It's like you need to have a lot of bioreactors for like the same. I think they have to probably do like four or five times the input for the same output as they are getting now. So, you know, it's like it's 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 hard for me to be like super open because like I I don't have a stake in this. I know people are really defensive about one side and another. I personally will never buy mycelium grown on grain that's that's my personal take yeah. on it <clears throat> wow I, I didn't realize it was such a divisive issue until i, I went to this mushroom co conference or this this mushroom event where there were mm -hmm. speakers everything was going well and then somebody came up and asked a question to the people on the panel they said do you use mycelium or fruit body in your product and all of a sudden it turned into this huge debate 
and people were getting really defensive. And I was like, I thought we were all about one love here. And there was people pointing fingers and people getting very hostile. And I was like, oh, maybe this is like a sensitive topic. But, you know, the, I guess what I'm thinking of on a deeper level is like maybe the pharmaceutical companies started off with these great grand visions of helping people and being very holistic. And then a few decades go by and you turn into the, to Bayer. <laughs> you know, it's all maybe, about yeah. profits and you're seeing how much you can extract. So I, you know, which is funny because the mushroom community that the mushroom ethos is so much about like being connected with nature and not really about profits and patents and that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And I, I think those are the, 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 the criticisms in that, in that sense. I, I personally don't know many people like as deeply divin into Doven don't even know that word in English. <laughs> deep, deep into that are as into mushrooms as, your as I am. English is probably better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, that like swear by mycelium grown on grain, except if they're working for a company that sells that product. So I think that that's that's a pretty big like like piece of evidence. Is like okay, if you're not working for or in a company that sells this product. I don't know many people's like that defending it like with their lives. So do with that as you take. Also, there's a lot of research out there, which I think is really interesting. And uh, most research done on mycelium on grain is actually funded by the people that have the companies that my are growing mycelium on grain. So it, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's an easy, easy add up. But again, I, I'm not saying you should just buy like from China or anything also like nothing wrong with what you want because it's definitely a lot more affordable but like I always say it's like just always steer, steer away from the large companies and go for something a little bit more local right there's tons of people growing their own mushrooms and making their own extracts in in the in the like uh, in their kitchen or something I think that's like super amazing and if you can support those people please do awesome yeah and I guess we'll, we'll wrap up. I have one question that's very open-ended. Amazing. Are you oh. optimistic about the future? I think I'm blessed with a, like a healthy amount of optimism. I'm also very realistic, right? Like I think as a student and a fan of history, besides just mushrooms, like I do think that the, like people always thought the world was ending so that 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 like comforts me it's not like a new thing yes it feels like the stakes are higher because we're so interconnected and like we see the whole world but I, yeah we're just like in an interesting time for sure i think like we can only do our best right and like i think with your platform with your offering and like what i see people like put in from like our students that come and like like had been like deep in what we call the matrix, right? And like we're wanting to step out and care more about healing and like taking care of the planet and themselves and all that stuff. I think that's that's beautiful. And I like I think mainly when we talk about we're destroying the planet, I think it's like we're a little full of ourselves. I don't think we can destroy the planet. Like the asteroid that hit the dinosaurs is like more force of impact than if we would like pile up all of the atom bombs that we've ever made in one big pile and detonate them all at once so like that the planet thousand. survived yeah. the, the, the planet survived that pretty easily look, look what's happening now you know so and we're like, not really talking about the, the planet we're, we're talking about we're destroying humans. ourselves not the planet yes. like save the yeah. humans i think i like saving the humans uh i i i would lie to myself if i don't think we're gonna get into like pretty disastrous climate change for some parts of the world that like are going to probably make life for a lot of people very difficult, if not impossible. And then we're going to see lots of immigration, which is all already happening. And that's also going to create conflict, but I'm sure there's like, you know, there's so many places that like 
we, we could end up and if it's a lot less of us that that would still be it so in that sense the long scheme of things i'm pretty hopeful where, where is it gonna go i don't know i i think what like we need another we need um what we need is like a big shift in in all powers versus the 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 new powers and like now like you know some of these these old thoughts and these old patterns they're they're getting really old you know and like it's i think it's really funny that like you know putin is 70 biden is like pretty old like a lot of these world leaders are really old right and they're clenching on and like we all know what this means when you're clenching on to the psychedelic experience you just like mm. you can't really like grow of reality and i think that generation just kind of needs to let go and make space for the new generation which is like probably hard for them so and also I, I don't know anybody in our generation with a good head on his shoulders that really wants to be in control of a country so i think we might see the collapse of the nation states in our lifetimes that's also like nation states are very new that's like very uh like post first world war that like that's really been a thing so i don't know it's uh, it's it's hard i can't predict the future i'm just like trying to make an easier, funner life with mushrooms and uh, living together and working together and uh, learning how to communicate effectively together. And I hope all of the luxuries and ease uh, that we have experienced so far can continue to experience because I like seeing different places in the world and I like being able to use this technology to chat to, to my friend Mark here on like a thousand miles away, you know? So uh i i'm pretty optimistic but i gotta be realistic and um yeah i i think more art more curiosity more playfulness and fun less seriousness and but also like more conscious understanding of like how to have smaller impacts you know it's like do we like i think it all starts with food you know it's like we like don't order so much food you have to throw it away <laughs> that's like a that's, really easy first step it. we could all can make like maybe oh they, i'm actually a really big fan of like city planning as well growing up in the netherlands it's like man can you just imagine that like you've been to amsterdam that like every city was planned like amsterdam and you can just cycle everywhere nobody who had to take a car we, we can do that like we can like scrap most fucking planes and like take trains everywhere like like trains that are powered by the sun like that shit is just all possible. If we all get our heads together, we can do it in five years. It's not hard, but hey, that's not what the the people with the power want right now. But that's that's my piece of take. I think if we want to, we can like make shifts really fast. Well, Jasper, I really appreciate your perspective, and you really have a fun way of teaching. I I, I love it. Appreciate you know, it. like education does not need to be boring at all, and I'm always smiling when I'm listening to you, you know, on Instagram or, or give any lecture, you know, you really make learning fun. So that's what it's Thanks, all about. Man. I appreciate that. You also make learning fun. It's like, I'm I was a to. big fan of after school before we ever collaborated together. So, uh, same, same to you, man. You have a, a, a great mind of like being able to portray information in like an engaging way and like something that's, that's modern and captivating and I'm, I'm thank just, you. Yeah, I'm stoked you're out there. <laughs> wow, thank you. That means a lot coming from you. And when we combine forces, we we really created some great videos. Like I'm, I'm super proud of those. Me too, man. It's uh, yeah. I I'll, like because your channel's so big. Sometimes like my friends just watch it, and they're like, my f one friend who's like super into Alan Watts, and he's like, he was like, I just watched Alan Watts videos, and suddenly you were recommended there. <laughs> That was really, that was a really fun moment. Yeah. Well, if you yeah, ever want to do fun. another video, let me know. Yeah. We gotta, we gotta yeah. have a little brainstorm session. What, what it will be. I got, got some vague ideas, but I think those, those we'll, we'll figure something out. I'll have to come to Guatemala for the next one. That's it. I That's it. To. Or we come to lighting in a bottle and then we'll eat some mushrooms <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then we'll try to figure out a new idea on the dance floor. Hmm. Sounds fun. I yeah i might see you there yeah man amazing well, uh, man. 
this has been awesome. Episode two. Episode two. Can I plug some things for a second? Absolutely. Yeah. Solid. All right. So we also have a YouTube channel and it has not been getting that much attention because we've just produced uh, basically a mini documentary series mushroom course called the fungal ecology course. It has over three and a half hours of like super curated video content, which is like super edited with like amazing B-roll and all that stuff. You name it. Super amazing. Um, but then there's also like guest lectures from like Juliana Fursi and William Padilla Brown and some other super amazing mycologists. Uh, so we have that that's happening now. So we're going to do live sessions every week until like May 25th. And then like, it's just, you can get that. And then we're going to go back in the YouTube channel. So the YouTube channel, just Fungi Academy, Fungi Academy everywhere, fungiacademy.com. We have a newsletter I, I, we put out like uh, for completely for free, all the news, what's happening in the microsphere on psychedelics and like have a little commentary on it. So that's fungiacademy.com slash newsletter. You can sign up. And yeah, we also like, you can either come to Guatemala to do any of our courses. We also have retreats. Um, so you can check that out on the website as well under the in-person section. And do, do, do. There's one more thing that I your want. Your Instagram. To I love your Instagram. I have a funky cami Instagram, of course. That's 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 a good one. Shout out to Karina. She's she's uh, managing that. Uh, I have one more. What was it? Yeah, you can learn how to grow mushrooms on the mu on online mushroom cultivation course. I have one more thing. That's awesome. Me oh, yeah. In... Yeah. Oh, go you ahead. can also come to, you don't have to come as a student. If you want to come and like hang out with us for like a couple months, we, we also have an application form to be a resident at the Fungi Academy community. Just come hang out, grow some mushrooms with us, do some permaculture. It's like, have like do that for your summer. Go find Sounds some great. mushrooms. It's rainy season here. It's like epic, epic mushroom biosphere. You have chanterelles, you have like, uh, go uh, like black trumpets we have like tons of uh hedgehog mushrooms like darius all the good stuff wow. lots of reishi come have fun like if the world does end you're really doing it right <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks man you gotta figure it out i think so all right this is episode two thank it's you happening. so much jasper you're so welcome mark thank you so much recording for recording here and